Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this second talk in our diverse series on supporting equity, diversity and inclusion within the research software engineering community. Um, our speaker today is Heather Turner, who's going to be talking to us about uh, equity, diversity and inclusion in the R community. Yeah, so um, as it was, uh, as I was speaking on, uh, on the 4th of May, I thought I'd take uh, the, the, uh, this, this opportunity to use this, this nice picture by Alison Horst uh, with the Star Wars theme, because as, as uh, Star Wars geeks uh, might know, May, May the 4th um, is a special day for Star Wars fans. Uh, and I thought this was a nice one um, representing teamwork and in particular a diverse team and of course that's what we're um, what we're aiming for in our in our communities. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, EDI in the R community um, and I realize that um, uh, many of you here might not be users of R or know very much about the R community. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving uh, a bit of background, uh, starting with a potted history of R, which will be uh, very, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> very restricted, but just to have a bit of context uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so R had its beginnings um, about 30 years ago, in 1992, um, when uh, Robert Gentleman and Rossi Harker, the original developers, um, developed a, a version of R uh, that they were using for teaching. So they were using it for teaching in statistics um, and initially developed just, just for their own use. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in about a year later, they started uh, sharing it with other academics and it began to be uh, used by others. And uh, a few years later, uh, they released it under an open source license. Um, which uh, again encouraged its wider use and uh, other people started getting involved in contributing to it. Um, and uh, a couple of years after that, um, the Comprehensive R Archive Network was established. That's the um, archive of our packages. And it began with just 12 packages um, compared to today when there's uh, not, I didn't check what the latest number is, but it's, I think it's getting on for like 19,000 now. So um, a big change from those days. Um, and they established a core team. So as I say, it started with just the, the pair of them uh, and a few collaborators joined in and this formalized into a core team of developers. Um, and they worked together on it for a few more years um, and until they thought it was mature enough to release a, a version 1.0 in the year 2000. Um, so, you know, it was quite sort of a, a few years to sort of get to that stage. And, and after that, it really sort of exploded in use um, and uh, started to be used uh, beyond academia um, in, in all sectors and, and across domains. And if we sort of fast forward to today, um, we can see that uh, for example, R is 11th in these TOB rankings of, of programming languages. And given that R is a, a specialized language, um, you know, focused on statistics and data science, um, you know, it's quite remarkable really that it's sort of at, at that level, um, you know, behind more general purpose languages like C or Python. Um, so it's, it's difficult to quantify, you know, the number of users, but it gives some indication that um, you know, it is widely used in, in a popular language. So that's sort of the development of, of R itself and, and behind it, you can sort of imagine the, the community growing. Um, and, um, but let's get back to thinking about uh, the diversity aspect. Um, well, this is, uh, somewhat difficult to measure because, you know, we don't have registered users and even if we did, they wouldn't necessarily tell us all about their, their demographics. Um, but there are some ways uh, we, we can get some ideas. Um, so there have been some stud studies of the maintainers of, of packages on CRAN. Um, so the most recent I'm aware of is, is this one from 2017. Um, and they looked at a couple of aspects and we'll look at gender diversity first of all. 
Uh, and you can see from the plot on the left that uh, yeah, there's a big imbalance. Uh, you know, men are nearly 90% of the maintainers of packages on CRAN. And, um, you know, you might think well, that's not so surprising because uh, the package maintainers are perhaps going to be the most technical developers, um, most uh, focused on perhaps the computer science and, and algorithms and so on, rather than the data analysis side. Um, but actually, we, it's not so different if we look at the general uh, community. So a couple of bigger surveys have been done of the general user community trying to reach a, a global audience of people in academia and business and, and so on. One run by the R Consortium, uh, which is a group of businesses that um, have, produced a, have uh, created a consortium to support the R project, and one by R Studio, which is uh, a large uh, or relatively large company within the R community uh, that develops um, an IDE for R um, and they have uh, you know wide contacts of, among R users and both of these surveys um, still found that 80% or, or more of the sample were uh, identified as, as men. Uh, and, you know, in, again, maybe that's not so surprising if, um, if we compare that to other sort of um, tech, tech communities, um, but we might expect the R community perhaps to be a bit, a bit more diverse in terms of gender because, because of that statistics focus and, you know, we have uh, perhaps bigger representation of uh, domains where that are more gender balanced, like biology, for example, or ecology, psychology. Um, so, you know, it's perhaps a bit disappointing. Uh, we might, the, uh, the survey of crown maintainers also looked at um, uh, geographical diversity, where, where the people were based. I think this is where they were based as opposed to where they're from. Um, and we can see that, uh, you know, like a lot of scientific communities, there's, there's a big bias towards the global north. Um, so uh, about 49% from Europe, 34% from, from North America, and um, other areas with a very large population like South America or Africa, um, you know, very un underrepresented. Um, so these are perhaps aspects of diversity that are uh, uh, easier to measure, and there are other things, of course, that, that we can think of and that will perhaps come back to you uh, later in the talk. Um, so for the rest of the time, I'm going to be thinking about uh, the EDI initiatives that have taken in place in the R community. So, um, yeah, so as I say, R was version 1.0 was released in, in the year 2000 and the community grew and nobody really thought too much <laughs> about diversity, except um, you know, I, th I think people became, were aware that it wasn't a very diverse community, um, but there wasn't much sort of action around it. And I think perhaps one of the first things uh, was this panel at the Use R conference in 2014. So Use R is um, the main R conference of the of the R community, and there was this panel uh, with a discussion um, focused particularly on on the representation of, of women in the R community and quite a heated discussion amongst uh, the users, developers, our core team members that were there and, and so on. And uh, so things started to move a little bit after that uh, in the following year, my, myself and a, another woman, Bettina Gruen, were elected to the R Foundation. And the R Foundation set up a task force uh, to work on initiatives related to um, improving the participation of, of women in the R community. And uh, I was part of setting that up. And um, so what did we do? We, we started uh, looking in particular um, at, the, at the Use R conference because we thought that was a, a reasonable um, place to start, a sort of defined community that, that we could um, that we could study and influence by, by um, changing the way the conference was run. Um, so the following year, we ran a, a survey of the participants at USAR 2016. And uh, actually the, 
the proportion of women in that survey was um, nearly a third, um, so perhaps not as uh, bad as you might expect, given the numbers I've already shown. Although bear in mind that we had already sort of started working with the use our 16, 2016 organizers and they themselves were already very aware of this issue. Um, so we had already put in quite a bit of effort to um, inviting women onto the committees and so on. Um, and there is also some evidence that perhaps women were able to be represented in the survey sample compared to um, the conference participants. So it's obviously not a perfect measure. Um, but one thing that became, um, oh, I another thing I should mention is this was a conference based in the US. So unsurprisingly, um, the attendees were largely uh, from, from the US. Um, so we, we have to sort of take that bias in, into account. Um, but despite that, um, even if we're sort of comparing to the, the US population, um, it was sort of obvious that there were other imbalances, for example, uh, overrepresentation of, of white and Asian people, uh, underrepresentation of LGBT people. And um, so in analyzing this data, we realized that we couldn't just focus on, on women, you know, that we had to think about other underrepresented groups as well. And that led to uh, a rebranding of the task force and we changed our name to Forwards. Um, and uh, with a long title of the Task Force for Women and Underrepresented Groups uh, to sort of acknowledge that change in focus. And um, so our, our sort of mission was to think about how we could widen particip participation in our foundation activities, such as the USR conference, um, the R journal that, it's pub that it publishes, uh, CRAN and, and the R project itself. And um, we've done this uh, through various angles in, in sub teams, looking at accessibility, uh, in particular disabled access to events and resources, um, community, working with um, community organizations, and we'll, that's another thing we'll come back to. Conferences, as I've already mentioned, on ramps means uh, sort of ways that we can encourage people to move from being a user of R to a, a developer. And um, running surveys, uh, we started doing a regular demographic survey at, at Use R. Um, and teaching, for example, running package development workshops. So here's some of the team members. Um, my, myself there and, and uh, Michael Lawrence from the R Foundation. And we tried to have a, a couple of people to lead up each team to sort of share the load. Um, and I won't read them out, but uh, it's this sort of um, gives you an idea of, of the people involved. Maybe you recognize some of them. And there are other um, members of the teams that I haven't listed here. So it's sort of fairly, grown to be a fairly large group of people working on this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Apart from the R Foundation, uh, another sort of a, um, official group, if you like, is the R Consortium. I think I, I did already mention them. Yes, because they, they ran the survey, one of the surveys that I mentioned. Um, so this is a, a business association versus the R Foundation, which is just a, a, a non-profit. Um, and so they've done a, a lot of work to support the, the R project and the community, um, not necessarily explicitly uh, focused on diversity, but um, a lot of particular projects have been, for example, they, they have funded um, some of the work forward, such as the package development workshops I've mentioned. Um, they set up working groups on, on different aspects. And one of those uh, was, um, so I'm just trying to remember what this, <laughs> this stands for. I think it's in inclusivity, diversion, equity, and accessibility, the R community idea group. Um, so that's a, a similar group to forwards, but more focused on uh, community based events rather than events run by the, the R Foundation. Um, and they also support our user groups, that's what RUG stands for, and conferences um, financially and, and in, in other ways. So one of the projects they supported was Our Ladies. Um, so the first Our Ladies group was actually set up very early, so you could say that this is one of the first uh, actions, perhaps I should have mentioned it sooner, 
Um, so that was the group set up in 2012 in San Francisco. And there were a few other groups uh, set up sort of in, independently. Um, but in 2016, uh, the San Francisco and London organized groups got together and put in a bid for an architectural grant to create Our Ladies Global. And that's when it really took off. Um, and you can see from this graph, you know, <laughs> the, the, the step change it made. Um, so uh, it went from, from being a, a handful of groups uh, to being over 200 chapters around the world today. Um, and if we compare where they are, oh no, that's another plot. Yeah, I also wanted to show the, show the global team. So this has taken a big te team of, um, of people to, to make happen. Um, and uh, there wasn't me to put all, all their names, but if you visit their, their team page, um, you'll, you'll see their names and, and, and the, the roles that they play um, in the organization. Uh, yes, what I was going to say is um, we uh, can compare um, the distribution of the Our Ladies chapters to the Our User Groups. Um, and one thing that we notice is that um, compared to the general Our User Groups, Our Ladies have been particularly strong in Latin America. Um, and yeah, also some, somewhat more uh, stronger in Africa. So although their mission is to particularly support uh, women and non-binary people, um, people of minority gender, um, they have also had an impact on, on the um, geographical diversity of, of the R community. Um, another uh, R consortium project um, was the uh, Saturday series of conferences. Um, the, these were set up uh, with just two conferences initially in 2016, uh, one in Budapest and one in South Africa. Um, so they were, had a very strong commitment to diversity from the start. You know, they, were, they wanted to have locally organized conferences that occurred all over the world and they aimed to have um, a, a spread of conferences in different regions of the world throughout the year. That's what they are always aiming to do. Um, and they wanted to make it an accessible conference. So for, for example, one, one of their policies is that the ticket price should be less than eight hours minimum wage um, in, in the local place that, that the conference is held. Um, and this has meant um, that as well as having conferences in, in Europe and uh, North America, there's also been um, six in Africa, one in South America, one in Asia, and one in Oceania. So again, um, a good a good spread, uh, helping to empower local communities. Now we're up to about 2017 in my in my sort of history. Um, back to USAR. Uh, by this time, um, we've had the survey and some recommendations were put forward uh, by the Forwards Group. And this led to things like a wider diversity scholarship scheme, subsidized childcare and improved code of conduct. Um, it was also at this time uh, that the Rainbow R group was established for the LGBTQ community. Um, and uh, this uh, a Twitter account was set up. Um, now this community has, has uh, sort of stalled a bit in recent years, but I'm happy to say that um, there's been a bit of movement again and, and um, we've been able to connect again with one of the regional organizers and, and hopefully that we'll see a bit more uh, work on the website and things to sort of uh, establish, um, re-establish that group. Um, another action by, by the R Foundation um, was beyond USAR to think about um, how we could reach uh, or support people in regions where use our wasn't wasn't reaching um, and so one way we did that was to endorse local conferences um, so there were uh, three in in Latin America um, one in Brazil one in Argentina one in Costa Rica and all of these um, have since become regular uh, conferences either either annually or, or every other year um, and um, that we also supported uh, an R day um, at an Indian statistical conference, IRRSA, 
um, in 2019 and hope to have a repeat of that at, at the end of this year uh, when it returns to India. Um, the Latin R conference helped to um, uh, yeah, facilitate the growth of a, of a local community, the Latin R community around that conference. And there have been other um, regional networks that have developed in slightly different ways. So Africa R um, was a movement that, that came out of the local R user groups um, collaborating together and trying to, to work together. Um, Asia R came out, and Arab R, in fact, um, came out of incubator sessions at the user R conference last year. Um, so that was a case of yeah, the, the community getting together and, and um, saying that they wanted something like this in their region. Um, and these work networks provide community for local R users, um, support existing user groups and uh, help set up new ones and also <coughs> organize, <coughs> organize regional events uh, like the Saturdays conference. And uh, as well as supporting the local community, this also obviously helps to establish people as, as leaders, um, developing their, their leadership skills, their organizing skills, and uh, raises their profile in, in the global art community. Um, so this is another way um, that it, it sort of helps uh, to improve the, the diversity of the, of the general community. Um, Minority R is a, uh, another uh, community organization. Uh, this was set up, um, I think, in 2019. Um, and uh, this is a community for um, any historically underrepresented R users. So obviously, R ladies is focused on people of underrepresented gender. Um, so if that doesn't apply to you, uh, but you're underrepresented in another way or an additional way, um, then uh, minorities in our provides a community. Um, and they do this through a Slack group, a blog, they provide webinars and tutorials, and they support people to go through our studios instructor certifications to help people, um, yeah, sort of demonstrate their, their ability and, and teach others. And uh, here is their team. It was founded by Danielle Smalls Perkins and Doris Scott after they met at an R Studio conference. And uh, the team has since expanded um, to bring in additional expertise and help with uh, tasks, particular tasks um, that, they, that they run. So those uh, things that I mentioned so far have been focused on the general user community. Uh, there's also been um, some work that's been more focused on the developer community, and by that um, I generally mean people that are uh, developing uh, our packages. Um, so one of these um, was the uh, Unconf, the Unconf events uh, run by our OpenSci, uh, the organization organization for open science uh, with R. Um, and these were very interesting events. Um, they were they ran them. Um, they were quite small events, um, carefully sort of curated, mostly um, inviting the people to come along. Um, and it, but they had a strong commitment to diversity. So they weren't just inviting people according to their uh, their art programming ability, but they were making a conscious effort to invite people from different underrepresented groups from different parts of the world bring them all together um, and great things happened. You know, they developed some great packages. It sort of um, really brought people together that, that then um, worked together, collaborated together, both in terms of programming work and also community work. Um, so that, that helped to further establish uh, things like Our Ladies, for example. Um, the Thai Diverse Developer Days were uh, slightly different. These were days that were attached to a, a conference, such as the R Studio Conference or the Use R Conference. Um, and they were perhaps a bit more traditional pack days, uh, working on the Thai Diverse set of packages uh, that are a popular set of packages that are sort of general purpose, so quite accessible for, for people to get into. Um, so they were open, you know, anybody could register. 
um, but they had a very sort of inclusive attitude. Um, you know, they made a big effort to to make them to encourage people, first time contributors to come, and uh, so I think that um, that helped to sort of uh, you know show that uh, uh, anybody could be had the potential to be a developer and that they were welcome. So I think that that, that helped to uh, create an inclusive event. Um, which, which leads us to the Our Contribution Working Group um, that is focused on uh, contributing to the R, the R project itself. Um, this was motivated by a, a panel um, uh, of our core developers at, at USAR 2020. Um, so this was a, a general panel, uh, but during the panel, they were asked about diversity issues and it seemed that they didn't have much of an answer at the time. Um, and so following the, the conference, um, we organized a meeting between some our core members and forwards and some community groups to sort of see how we might, we might address this. And that led to this, uh, the establishment of this, this working group with the aim to foster a, a more diverse community of contributors to the R project. Um, in some ways, this was sort of the original aim of the, of the forwards task force, but we kind of needed to do more groundwork in the community and having done that, it sort of made sense to sort of set up a more focus group um, with this stronger partnership between our core and, and community groups. So um, in our first year, uh, we set up a, a website to sort of be a home for, for this, this work and to bring together different resources related to contributions that was easier to find. Um, set up a Slack group to try and um, create a more welcoming and inclusive space for people that are interested in finding out more about contribution. Um, we developed a guide on our development um, that uh, we hope to be a bit more uh, newbie friendly compared to the sort of official documentation and um, organized two contributor focused tutorials at USAR. Uh, which was surprisingly, this was the first time this had happened. You know, we'd have lots of tutorials that use our conferences before, um, but they, they'd always been about a package or a type of analysis, um, where these were particularly about um, either contributing to R through um, bug review and, and fixing, uh, or uh, translating R to your language. So translating the, the messages and errors and warnings that are in R, um, which can be contributed back to, to R itself, so that becomes part of the, the standard distribution. Uh, a recent initiative that we've been working on is uh, uh, the, this series of collaboration campfires. And uh, again, we've been focusing on what we think are novice friendly topics, you know, good ways to get started in contributions. So that's again, the bug handling and the contributing translations. Um, and we've been trying to do this in a way, you know, that particularly encourages uh, participation by people from underrepresented groups. So we've been working with community champions to get feedback and help us uh, spread the word about the events. And we've been doing very targeted promotion, both in terms of reaching out to particular groups, but also particular people uh, within those groups um, to encourage people to come and, and to uh, so that they feel welcome at the event. So maybe I'll say a little bit more. These are sort of 90 minute sessions um, where we uh, try and do, uh, give a little bit of introduction, um, but also focus on sort of hands-on activities um, and try to make them quite informal compared to uh, you know, a more traditional uh, tutorial where there'd be a bit a bit more sort of teaching from the front. Um, looking ahead, uh, we've got a few things sort of uh, on the go. We've got a Google Season of Docs project that will um, expand and uh, reorganize the development guide to hopefully make it more useful. Um, some particular aspects of that are contributing a, a new chapter on um, contributing translations, which wasn't included in the, in the first draft. Um, another aspect will be about using a, a Git workflow to um, 
uh, test uh, bugs, bug patches, uh, because R is um, uh, maintained in a, in a subversion repository, um, which isn't so familiar to people, but there is a Git mirror. So there is a way that that can be used uh, to create a more familiar workflow. Uh, we've also got a summary of code project related to the, the translations work. So this will provide a dashboard. So it'll be easier for people to see uh, what the current status is and where contribu contributions would be welcome. And uh, after use, immediately after use R, we're planning a bug barbecue event, which we hope will be perhaps a little bit like uh, the Tidyverse developer days, except of course, uh, because USAR is online this year, it's going to have to be an online event. So we're going to have to allow for different time zones. Um, so it's going to be quite a challenge, but um, the idea is that we'll work together to tackle bugs and hopefully do it in a way that uh, new people will be able to get involved. Uh, so these are some of the people that have been involved in the R contribution working group. Um, Saranjit Kaur, who worked on the R development guide and the collaboration campfires. Um, Louise, who's worked on um, some of the bug zero analysis. Uh, Michael Chirico and Michael Lawrence again, um, working on the translations tutorial. Uh, Gabriel Becker and Martin Meffler, the contributing tutorial. So in both cases, those, those tutorials are teaming up between um, an R core member and a community member. And then we've got uh, Cara Wu and, and, and Gwyn um, from, that helped us to link to our ladies and, and my R, uh, plus several others who I didn't include here who have joined in with um, the meetings and discussions on Slack and so on. So I said I'd talk a little bit about impacts. So I've just got a few minutes left. Um, but yeah, this isn't very, uh, analytical in a sense, and this is just going to be a few sort of closing thoughts um, because it, it's very difficult to measure measure the impact. I think in terms of the user community, uh, the grassroots community such as Our Ladies and My R have had a big impact on um, sort of changing the feel of the R community, making it a welcoming community, I think, for most people. Um, but the sort of uh, official organizations like the R Foundation and the R Consortium uh, have, have definitely played a role in terms of um, stimulating certain things to happen or and or providing support uh, when something comes up from the, from the grassroots. Um, in terms of uh, the CRAN, uh, the sort of package maintainers, uh, it'd be good to have some up-to-date up data on that. So the data I presented was from 2017. So, you know, it's five years old now. Um, but of course, we would need to have really large changes to sort of make an impact there because there's that, that backlog of packages that, that will still be there from in, the most, in most cases. Um, so, you know, we'd have to have a lot of contributions by, by women, for example, to really shift those percentages. Um, for, for our core and the sort of contributors to the project itself, it's it's still early days, I think. So I think there's been some useful groundwork, um, but uh, yeah, we, there's still a lot to do. Um, USAR, I think is, as I say, it was a little bit more of a manageable target. Um, we, we did see a, an increase, for example, in, in the gender balance in recent years. Um, but again, this has been complicated a little bit by, by COVID. Um, so uh, COVID um, meant that we had to move the conference online. And this has a big impact in terms of diversity. We were able to get uh, a much wider group involved because we weren't sort of restricted to, to using a local committee. So that meant we were able to get good representation of different groups on the organizing and program committees. Um, and just being online has had a big, big impact. So um, most notably um, in where people were able to attend. Uh, so this is uh, the countries that, that uh, people came from at the at last year's online conference. And we did still have a lot of people coming from, from the US, um, but then this was balanced by, you know, quite, quite sizable 
participation from countries like Brazil and India, Argentina, Kenya, Ethiopia. Um, so, that, you know, that had a, a big impact. Um, so this is sort of, yeah, complicated things a little. And, um, you know, whether we'll be able to keep that um, if, if we move back to a hybrid format, for example, or um, a main conference plus hubs or some other format, yeah, that's a bit of an open question. So I think, I think that's about my time. So I'm interested to see uh, what questions people have and um, yeah, what thoughts that sparked off. <laughs>